it was just a couple of years ago on Netflix, a special came out, and that Netflix special was called Stranger Things. Maybe you watched it, maybe you, you, you knew a little bit about it. It was a, a story of some kids that had a, um, a science experiment gone wrong, and, and all these kind of unusual and, quote, strange things happened as a result of it, and, and, and it was just kind of the tracking them walking through all these kind of strange adventures and, 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 and unusual kind of happenings, and, and it was something that kind of became very electric. I mean, a lot of people watched it, a lot of people liked it. It, and this is Brett's simple theory, so I, you know, I don't know if it's really true or not, but I think part of the reason it was so captivating was because so many of us live ordinary, normal, nothing ever changes, day to day, just keep going, keep doing what you were doing. This week looks a lot like last week, which looks like last month, and, and we're just kind of in this, this, this lane of sameness, and so anytime something unusual happens, anytime something strange happens, it kind of draws us in, like, well, what's this about? Well, what, what is this going on? What, what's going on here? We, we kind of like strange things, and maybe that makes you strange, maybe it doesn't make you strange, but we like strange things. They're interesting, they're unique. For some of you, the reason you like strange things, and I know this doesn't apply to everybody, so, so you just kind of bear with me if this isn't you, is because your life is strange, Right, And not necessarily strange in a bad way, but it is strange. You have this calling on your life that not everybody else has. And it, it's different. It has changed the way you see the world. It has changed your relationships. It has tra- changed your values and your priorities. And, and this calling is something that, uh, not in a negative way, but it's a heavy thing. It's an important thing. It's something that, that really kind of serves as a compass for the rest of your entire life. And that calling is to follow Jesus. And when you said yes and you became a follower of Jesus, you started living a strange life, one that looked different than everybody else's, one that was kind of surprising and, and, and valued things differently than everyone else values. And, and you made choices to do things that, honestly, nobody else would choose that in that situation. Jesus talked about it, and we actually talked about it a couple of weeks ago, we, he, he called it a salt of the earth or light of the world kind of life. It was just incredibly different. And you're, you're okay with being strange because you have spent the time that you've been following Jesus realizing something, that you want to live up to this calling, that, that you want to live a life that's worthy of this calling that you received. There's something about it that, that pulls you and compels you, and it, it's not the novelty of it. It's the meaning of it. There is a purpose to your life. There is an identity that you have. There is a meaning in what's going on that that is just so magnetic. It literally has begun to dominate everything. Everything about your life is touched by this calling. And, And you may have never thought of it this way, but that makes you strange. Because most people don't have that. Most people don't have that magnetic north. They don't have that internal values. They don't have that sense of calling and purpose about their life. And I I don't want to make assumptions today. There's a lot of people here. A lot of people will watch this online. and, And so I'm not assuming that every single person that hears me is a follower of Jesus. But I want to tell you, I'm I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're listening because, because you may end up being inspired by what we talk about today. You may end up, if nothing else, getting an explanation because you probably have noticed something that followers of Jesus, not all the time, I wish it was true all the time, but every once in a while, when we're at our very best, we do things that you can't explain, that you kind of scratch your head. Why would they do that? Why would they respond that way? Why would they choose that? That's not what normal people do. And so maybe, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, you might get some explanation. But for those of you that are followers of Jesus, you know, right? You know. Jesus himself said there's going to be something that marks you out. There's going to be something. It's like wearing an ID tag or a bracelet or or, or something like that 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 marks you out as different. And he said everybody's going to see it. And as soon as they see it, they're going to know that you're different, that you're strange, that you're one of those And it's not what we would expect. He said, you're going to love each other so well that it's going to mark you out as strange. People are going to think you're odd because you love so well. That that the way you love one another is the identifying mark for these strange people that are living out this incredible calling 
and trying to live a life that's worthy of it. And I don't know if you've ever, you know, taken it this far. Because that's a nice sentiment. We're so loving. We're the most loving people. That's great. If you really put it into motion, though, what does love actually look like? I mean, it can include warm feelings, of course. It can include nice sentiments, yes. But when you really get right down to it, we can find people everywhere to tell us they love us. How do you know that they love you? I think one of the primary ways you know somebody loves you is when they're willing to serve you. Not for money, not because they have to, not, not because they're going to get something out of it or they're trying to manipulate a situation, but they simply choose to serve you, expecting nothing in return. See, to me, I think that is really nuts and bolts kind of evidence of love. And so when you live out this calling, when you choose to serve other people, in one sense, what you're doing is you're making a choice to live a strange life. You're choosing to live a consistently remarkable life. And I don't mean to say that if you're not following Jesus, you're not living a remarkable life. I don't know. I do know this. Everybody that I've ever met that has authentically followed Jesus has lived an incredibly remarkable life. And we learned something along the way. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, one of the things we learn is, as nice and as wonderful it is to have an understanding spouse, that's not all of it. And as phenomenal as it is to have successful kids, that's not all of it. And as wonderful it is to have a job that you actually like, <laughs> that you, you like going into work and you feel like your job is making a difference and you feel good about what you're doing, that's part of it, but that's not, that's not all of it. And we all pretty well along the way figured out that a beautiful home, a nice vacation, a good retirement account, good things, but it's not all of it. And the reason I know that is because I've met people just like you that have a great marriage, are raising good kids, they love their job, they're financially secure, they live in a nice place, and they still feel like something. It's just, it's not quite there. And as a follower of Jesus, you know the secret. You absolutely know the secret. You figured it out. That you're a part of something that started before you were born. That's going to continue after you die. You're a part of something that's so much bigger. God is redeeming all of creation. And he included you and he wants you to be a part of it. That becomes the North Star for every follower of Jesus. And I know, that's the theory part, right? That's the part you hear at church. That's the part that you're like, yep, that's, what's, that's the answer. That's what the answer's supposed to be. And then Monday happens. And I have to go to work. And I have to be around those people. Or some of you, I have to go home after this and be with those people in my home. Like, I get it. You know, somebody's guilty by laughing, okay? <laughs> like, I get it. I do. I absolutely get it. How do you reconcile this ideal with normal and everyday life? How, how, what, there's a gap there. What happens? How do you do that? How do you navigate this idea of living a strange life in a sea of normal when everything pushes against it? What do you do? You're not the first, and you certainly won't be the last to wonder about that. A man named Paul wrote a letter to a little church very similar to ours called, uh, it, the name of the city was Ephesus, and he wrote a letter to the Ephesians. You know, not super creative, but, but we understand exactly where this letter was going. Because in this church, they were struggling with some things. And in Ephesians 4, he gives us a very practical answer to how you bridge that gap. What does that look like? Because I, I know the ideal and I know what my life looks like, and they're not lining up all the time the way I'd like them to, so what do I do? And so if you have a Bible or you want to follow along, Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 11 in just a moment, but, but here's what you need to know about the Ephesians. They were just like you. They had marriages that didn't always work. They had kids that were sometimes really demanding. They had schedules that were full, like way too full, and they spent a lot of their time feeling tired, right? They knew and they wanted, the want to was there, just like it is with you. I want to live that life. The actual doing of it, that was where they were running into problems. And that is where what Paul shares with them in Ephesians 4.11 really connects for us. 
He talks about this strange life. He talks about what it looks like. And then he talks about what God does in response to the gap, to the place where we know what we want, but we aren't always living it in truth. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I know that's a little bit of a mouthful, but he's telling us something, that God gives leaders to prepare us to serve. God gives leaders to prepare us to serve. And you might think, well, how does that bridge the gap? Those things don't seem like they go together. And so I need you to just humor me for, for just a moment. He says there's really two things, that God puts spiritual leaders in your life for two reasons. One, to build you up and mature you and make you more like Jesus, which I think we all nod our head. Yep, that makes sense. The other reason he puts spiritual leaders in your life is to equip you, to prepare you so that you can do the work of the ministry, so that you can serve each other. And that's where it becomes a little bit of a head scratcher. First of all, that sounds strange. Second of all, how is that going to bridge the gap? I mean, that doesn't seem like the outcome. That doesn't seem like the formula that we need. But before I answer that question, I need to tell you a little bit about my history because I think, hopefully, maybe my history is, is similar to yours. Now, I know not everybody grew up like I did. I grew up in a, in a, in a family that was serious about following Jesus. And, I, and because of that, I grew up in a church. And when I read this and hear about this and I think about who are the spiritual leaders that God put in my life? I go back to when I was around seven or eight years old. It's the first time I kind of remember anything about church and going. I mean, I was going, but my parents were just bringing me. I didn't know any different. And suddenly it dawned on me that there was a calling, that there was a response that Jesus had invited me into and that I had to respond to that. And I said yes, not knowing very much, but many, like many of these kids that we baptized this morning, not exactly sure everything that that meant. And I had a spiritual leader he was a pastor of our church. His name was Jim Harvey. And Jim walked with me and my family for several weeks to help me understand what it meant to follow Jesus. And so I was often on my way. And then later, about the age of 15, a man named Bob Buring, he was one of our leaders in our church. He worked with the students. And he helped me navigate not only the initial calling that I had to follow Jesus, but a, another calling that, that somehow I couldn't put it into words exactly, but I knew that going into ministry was supposed to be my future, that, that, that I should pursue the idea of being a pastor and didn't understand it. I thought God made a mistake, didn't think it would be me. And he helped me walk through that. And he equipped me and he prepared me and he helped mature me. And then there was Perry Johnson. He led my college group. Perry uh, was a dad. Uh, Perry had a son my age, and, and he led our college Bible study. And he spent so much time with us. He played basketball with us. He went to go eat with us. He hung around with us. He had us in his home all the time. And one of the things that Perry equipped me to do was to take my faith with me to work because I worked in a lot of odd jobs and a lot of strange places, and, and Perry worked in a pretty rough place, and he taught me what it looked like to follow Jesus, even if you work in a place that has no interest in Jesus. Not too long after that, I got married, and Don and I were trying to figure out what it meant to be a couple and what it meant to, to, to love God and being married and, and all the things that go with that, and, and God put Jean and Belva Barrick in our life. And they taught this young marriage class and much like Perry, they had us in their home and they spent time with us and they talked to us and they, they let us see what their marriage looked like and it helped us understand what our marriage could look like. The pastor of that church, and by this time his name was Mark Mucklow and he, he, he learned that I had this calling to ministry and so he pulled me aside and he spent a, a couple of years with me on a regular basis just talking about what it meant to lead and to pastor. And then I came to Mountain Ridge and Monty Patton did the same for me and taught me how to pastor people. And I've had these spiritual leaders, all these points and, and, and situations in my life that have equipped me and have matured me. Now that's my story but what about yours? When you look back, when you think back, and hopefully some of them are here in this church, who are the people that have invested in you? Who are the people that have prepared you and equipped you 
brought you up and matured you in Jesus. Who are those people? I know God has put them in your life. He put them there to help close the gap between the right answer and the day-to-day life. And it, again, it seems odd that it would be those two things, that it would be the maturing part we get. You taught me some things. You showed me some things. But you equipped me to serve. That's the next piece of this. It says not only does God give us leaders to prepare us, God gives us opportunities to serve. He talked about all these different roles and gifts, and in other places, Paul, who wrote Ephesians, he talks about spiritual gifts, and if you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard of spiritual gifts, and, and maybe you've done, they, they have these little assessments you can take, and they give these lists and, and all of that, and, and sometimes people get really concerned about figuring out their gift, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to know your spiritual gift, and as a matter of fact, if you didn't know this, if you're a follower of Jesus, the Bible tells us very plainly, you have a spiritual gift, and I will never forget One of my teachers, one of my spiritual leaders told me one day, he said, do you know what a spiritual gift is? And I'm like, yeah, it's, you know, I'm I'm young. I'm thinking, yeah, it's something that kind of makes me special, different, you know, better than everybody else. And he goes, no, 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 no. You know what a spiritual gift is? It's a ministry assignment. It's what God has marked out for you to do for others. He said, if you'll look, every spiritual gift that's out there is for the benefit of somebody else. Yes, you have this gifted ability to do something, but the way it works is you do it for them. You do it, in a sense, to help them. So it's good to know your gift, but it's so much better, so much better to choose to be a gift. It it is good, like I said, to know what it is. But really, the question is more about willingness. If I believe that I've been equipped to serve... And I believe that God has given me gifts to serve others with. There's really only one missing piece, right? Am I willing or not? And I get it. Because just like them, marriages don't always work. Kids can be demanding. The schedule is full. So many of us are walking around tired. The idea of adding more, (sighs) it just feels like too much. It just feels like, you know, I can't add on another thing. I can't do that. It reminds me of a story. <laughs> Rachel Nichols tells a story of, of trying to teach her kids about serving. Um, and, and so her youngest son, Brady, unfortunately, Brady broke his foot. And so he's, you know, poor little guy is on crutches. And it's, it's hard enough if you break your foot as an adult. You can imagine if you're a little guy. But the worst part of all of it was Monday was his birthday. And he was going to celebrate his birthday at school in his class. And he so wanted that moment, which you can't, you can't, you can't blame him. He wanted that moment where he walks in with the armful of cupcakes and everybody cheers and he gets to celebrate his birthday with his friends. And he was so looking forward to that. But now with the crutches, he can't do it. So Rachel decided, hey, this is easy. I'll fix this for Brady. She asked Noah, her older son, which I got to tell you before you hear what Noah says, I kind of like Noah uh, in a bad way, all right? He's funny, but uh, he's a little bit of a smart aleck. Uh, He asked Noah, would you do me a favor? Would you carry the cupcakes for Brady and go with him to his class? And Noah says, I could, but I prefer not to. (laughs) A little jerk. I could, but I prefer not to. And dad decides, dad decides, this is the perfect learning opportunity. I'm not going to yell at him. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use this as a teaching moment, you know, gentle parenting, right? And he says to him, he goes, well, Noah, what do you think Jesus would do? And Noah doesn't miss a beat. He says, Jesus would heal his foot so he could carry his own cupcakes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) When it comes to serving, so many times, I've had the heart of Noah. Eh, Somebody else can do it. If God really wants it done, he'll do it. You know, it doesn't need me. Why do I have to do it? And I miss something. And if you've ever felt like Noah, you're missing something too. You see, we tend to think of serving as a task that we're doing. Something else to add to the calendar, some other job we need to do, some other responsibility we're taking on as if we don't have enough. But that's a wild misunderstanding. You see, serving is actually something incredibly sacred that happens. And I know it's hard to think of it this way because it's just not the norm, but we're, we're talking about strange things, right? It is strange. And let me, let me explain. Let's say, for example, you saw me and I needed something and you decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help. I want to serve him. I, I want to do something for him. 
And so as a follower of Jesus, you come and serve me as a follower of Jesus. And you know what happens in that moment? It is so profoundly incredible that I can't believe we overlook it and I'm guilty of it too. But do you know what happens in that moment? For me, for me, the one who gets served, you know what happens? I see a glimpse of Jesus in the person that's serving me. They're serving me not because they have to, not because they can get anything out of it, not because they're making any money, not because they're trying to manipulate the situation. They're simply serving me for the sake of loving me. And I see Jesus in that. But what about the person doing the serving? Now, this is, this is a little bit complicated, but I think, you're gonna, I think you're gonna track with me on this. When I serve somebody else, you know what actually happens? It reminds me of something. It reminds me of how Jesus has served me. The reason I'm doing it is not because I feel guilty. It's not because it's my duty. It's not because I looked around and nobody else would do it, so out of disgust, I finally decided, well, I guess I'll have to. No. I see how Jesus has served me. And if he's done it for me, why, why wouldn't I do it for others? What a privilege to do it for others. And so you and see this, this incredible exchange is happening. One person is seeing Christ in the one that is serving. The other person is seeing how Christ has served them as they serve someone else. And for some of you, being served is even harder. You're the one that's like, well, you know, it's easier for me to do for others than it is to let others do for me. And that is, I, I, I'm not trying to make you upset, that is pride. When I have to back down and let somebody serve me, and I see Jesus in them, reminds me that I am dependent on him and I am dependent on you. And again, for the one that serves, it grows them, it matures them. They humble themselves to serve somebody else that they don't have to, that they gain nothing from it because they want to serve. So let me put it in like just everyday, normal uh, things we can get a hold of right here that happen on a Sunday morning. See, when you greet someone, some of our greeters, you greet someone on the patio. You could think of it as, you know, I'm just opening the door. I'm just saying hi. I'm just being friendly. Or you could recognize, no, this is a moment. This is an important moment. It's a moment of transformation. It's a little slice. It's a moment of transformation. This is not a transaction. When I just do something as simple as greeting people and make them feel comfortable and loved, when I welcome a toddler into the classroom who's a little bit concerned, who's a little bit scared, and I make them feel comfortable, it is a moment of transformation. When I lead my small group on Wednesday night and I gather them together, and it, it's hard because I have to study and I have to get ready and I don't always know who's going to show up, but I get ready and I want to serve them. It's a moment of transformation. When I pray with a student who's relationship with their parents is not going well and I pray with them and I pray for them. It's a moment of transformation. When I help a fourth grader try to understand something that's a little complicated from the Bible because I want him to know how much God loves them and values them, it's a moment of transformation. When I make coffee for someone, it's a moment of transformation. You see, these aren't transactions. This isn't serving for the sake of doing it. It is how God built the church. This is the church. You hear me say it all the time. It's not a building. It's not a name. It's not an institution. It is none of those things. The church is you and me following Jesus together. And he tells us that the way that people are going to know who we are, the way they're going to recognize us is because we love so, so well, which means we're going to serve each other. And I know, I know the reputation of the church is not always great. I don't just mean Mountain Ridge. I mean the church in general. It is not hard to find people that have been hurt, burned, or critical of the church and, and feel like uh, they're too this, they're too that, they're not enough this, they're not enough that. I mean, there's all kinds of comments and criticism and honestly, some of it we've earned. Some of it we've earned because there have been spiritual leaders in the church that did not lead people well in love. There have been people in the church that did not treat others with love. So, so we have earned a little bit of the criticism and I understand sometimes why people are down on the church, but do you know who is not down on the church? Do you know who is not a critic of the church? Jesus. Jesus says the church is his bride. 
He says the church is his body. He sees it as incredibly important. He loves the church. He loves us. He calls us his chosen ones, his precious ones. And I know this sounds kind of crazy, but some of you need to hear this. He likes us. More importantly, he likes you. Well, yeah, but I'm, and, I, I, and he likes you anyway. And that's why he puts leaders in your life. And that's why he gives you opportunities. But he's not done. He has one more thing to say about this. In verse 14, he says, once this happens, once you actually start serving each other, once you start growing up in Christ, you're equipping each other, you're doing these things, then, verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. He tells us, this is how you close the gap. You you grow up, And one of the ways you grow up is by serving each other. And as you serve each other, it matures you. And all of the sudden, you speak the truth in love in a world that speaks lies out of hate. You grow up to be stable and solid in a world where everything seems to change just with the trends and with politics and culture. And it just changes like that as to what's important and what's not important. And you start to look a little bit strange. And the way you got there is by doing something strange. You got there by serving each other and growing up in Christ likeness. Now I'm going to say something. And I thought a long time about this. I really did. Because I don't, I really do not want this to come across as hurtful. And, I, and for those of you that know me, I, I, maybe I got a little, little bit more credibility. And those of you that are new, I'm asking you to just maybe for a moment give me the benefit of the doubt. I want to talk to you, if you've, if you've been part of a church or this church for a while, and as you look back and you think back, and I'm telling you this out of love because I don't want you to miss, I don't want you to miss what God has for you. This is such a key ingredient, this idea of serving others is such a key ingredient in becoming who he created you to be. And I don't want you to miss out on that. But if you look back, and as you think about your connection to the church, and your engagement level with the church. And you can remember a lot of things the church has done for you, the way people have invested in you and loved you and brought you up and helped you and equipped you and prepared you and ministered to you. But you can't really get a hold of any time where you've been able to do that for somebody else. Where there's been all kinds of things that have come in to your life. But not much has come out of your life, specifically in regards to loving and serving the people that you're connected with. It could explain why you feel stuck. It could explain why your spiritual growth has kind of just leveled off and hasn't budged. It could explain why this thing that is supposed to be the focus of your life is something that you can check in and and check out of once or twice a month, and that's all you need. It could explain those things. And I don't want that for you. I don't want you to miss what he has for you. This is so much bigger than saying, I will serve at my church. This is about forming the character of your heart. It is about living out this strange life. It's a strange outcome. I give it to you. I would have never guessed that. I probably would have never designed that. But the way God designed it was this. You grow into Christ-likeness as you serve other people. He put it together, and it's beautiful. But it's not our first assumption when we think about how we would grow and how we would change. And so if that's been your experience, I, I can't invite you, I can't encourage you enough to say you need to find a place and a way to connect and to serve the people in this church. And maybe it's a formal thing, maybe it's a formal position and a formal role, or, or maybe it's informal and it's bringing meals to people and taking people for rides and calling that friend or praying with someone. I don't know. I do know 
that he's given you leaders, he's given you opportunities, he's given you gifts, and he's inviting you into this life-changing kind of situation. And I know it seems a little bit trite when we talk about the church, but it's absolutely true. Serving together makes us better. You grow, I grow, you serve me, it changes me, it changes you, I serve you, it changes you, it changes me, it changes all of us. So here's what I want to do, and I'm going to ask you, even if you're, man, you may, be, uh, you may be hips deep in serving opportunities already, but I want everybody for just a moment to get their phone out. Just grab your phone, just take it out, it's super, super simple. Get your phone out, because here's what I want to invite you to do. For some of you, you need to explore this a little bit. You need to kind of uh, reach out just a little. You need to extend yourself just a touch and say, hey, maybe this is the right thing. Maybe this is the right moment. And I'm going to ask you to text this number. And we'll just put it up on the screen. I'm going to ask you to text the word serve to this number. And here's what's going to happen. You're not signing up. This isn't I'm in here for life. This is an opportunity for you to say, here's my information. And here's an area maybe where I would love to find out a little bit about how I might be able to serve and have some of this transformation that you're talking about. You're not committed. We'll have people connect with you. And if you're already serving, you don't need to do it again. But if for some reason you're not, you haven't, it just hasn't worked out, it hasn't made sense yet, you're not sure what it looks like, you feel like you have kind of, kind of capped out, and maybe you just want to text the word serve to that number, and it'll do something really simple. It'll send you a link, and you punch on that link, it's a little form, you can fill it out in about 20 seconds, and we'll follow up with you, and we'll help you, because that's what we are called to do as spiritual leaders. See, myself, Pastor Corey, the rest of our, our, our ministry team, our elders, our core volunteers here at our church, they have two jobs. They absolutely have two jobs to help you grow up into the fullness and maturity of following Jesus and to equip you to serve and do ministry. And that's exactly what we want to do for you because we know that God has something incredible for you in that. See, this is how everything changes. This is how you understand and process and experience spiritual growth. By taking a step, by taking a risk, by going one more time forward. And you know what it means? It means we together end up becoming a loving place where people from the outside go, I don't understand it. I don't know what they're doing all the time. But man, look at the way they love each other. <laughs> look at the way they take care of each other. There's something to that. It's strange, but it's wonderfully strange. I want to do something for you before we get out of here today. This same book of Ephesians, uh, Paul wrote, and, and in, in it, he wrote down a prayer. And, and sometimes when we don't know exactly what to pray or we're new to the idea of praying, we're kind of, um, you know, I don't know what the right word is, but we're not always comfortable praying. And, and this is just a little free tip. If you will take the prayers that you find in the Bible and use them as your own as you get started, it will make an incredible difference in your prayer life. And Paul prayed for these Ephesians. And so I want to read it because I want you to hear it. And then I also want to pray it over you. He says this way, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we long for transformation. God, we've, we've had enough of the transactions. We know what that's like. Father, we also know what it's like to feel short, to feel like there's an ideal out there that we're not hitting, that we're not getting close to. We know we should, we know we want to, but at the same time, we feel like we're, we're coming up short. And I thank you that we can pray this prayer along with Paul. And so, Father, I pray out of your glorious riches that you would strengthen each and every one of us with your power through your Holy Spirit. Father, on the inside of our lives, in our, in our souls, in our hearts, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. 
Father, I thank you that you have rooted and established us in your love. Would you give us power together with everyone here, all of your holy people, that we would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And we would know this love that is beyond knowledge. That you would fill us to the measure. Give us all we can take of the fullness of God. Father, we love you. We thank you for this morning. And we thank you for these moments. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.